We have uh, been talking about uh, central force functions in the case in which the force center has an infinite mass. So the problem becomes essentially a one-body problem in the remaining particle. Uh, today I'd like to take one example of that, a fairly obvious example, which is uh, namely one in which the potential is zero. In that case, there is no force center and it doesn't matter at all. So let's talk about the free particle where the potential is zero. In this case, the uh, Hamiltonian, of course, is just p squared over 2m. Uh, this is really the free momentum squared, so to emphasize that all that is the square of a vector. Um, if you want to solve the, the uh, free particle Hamiltonian, the Schrodinger equation for h psi equals b psi for the um, free particle Hamiltonian in three dimensions, uh, the most obvious choice of a complete set of commuting observables is the three components of momentum, dx, dy, and dz. Uh, these, of course, commute with each other, and they also commute with the Hamiltonian, so that an eigenstate of px, py, and pz is automatically an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian with an eigenvalue, which is p squared over 2m. Uh, this is really, of course, the same equation as I have over here for the Hamiltonian, except here the Hamiltonian and the momentum are considered operators, and here they're considered c numbers or eigenvalues, but it's the same relation anyway. Uh, in this case, we know what the wave functions are. The eigenfunctions of momentum in the x representation as a function of x are just plane waves. They're e to the i p dot x over h bar. And if you want to normalize them with the uh, delta function normalization, you need to divide by 2 by h bar to the 3 halves. So this is, this, is the, uh, uh, this is the most obvious solution. This is also the solution you get by separating the wave equation in rectangular coordinates. However, it's more in accordance with what we've been uh, talking about recently to think about a different complete set of commuting observables, but namely one in which we have the Hamiltonian uh, L squared and LZ, because that's what we normally think of in central force motion. And as I've explained in the previous lecture, we get an, an eigenstate in L squared and LZ automatically uh, by making the total wave function the product of a radial wave function times the YLM. And in which case the radial wave function satisfies one of two different versions here of the radial wave equation. Version one is in the original variable r, and version two is in a modified variable I'm calling f, uh, just a scale factor of r, the radius between them. Um, for the free particle, it turns out that version one is the more convenient version to use. Uh, before I write it down, however, let me note something which actually follows uh, fairly obviously from the, from the solution in the rectangular coordinates which is the energy of the free particle has to be positive or non-negative. Uh, this is clear because the eigenvalue is the square of the momentum and has to be positive. So the same thing, of course, is true regardless of the coordinate system, so it's going to be true in the spherical coordinates as well. But what it means is that we can define a, uh, an effective wave number uh, for the solution, call it K, which is the square root of 2ME. E is the positive eigenvalue. And then I mentioned this, the spectrum is continuous, so there's no quantization. Uh, divided by h bar, this gives us a wave number. And it allows us to introduce a dimensionless radial variable I'll call rho, which is equal to k times r. And if we make this substitution then into the uh, version 1 of the radial Schrodinger equation, in which the, uh, this is wrong, this is plus the true potential v of r. Uh, in, which the in which the true potential vanishes, so there's only, there only a centrifugal potential, then the radial equation we get in the terms of the rho variable is this. It's minus 1 over rho squared times uh, dd rho of rho squared times r plus the quantity, which is L times L plus 1 over rho squared uh, uh, minus 1 uh, times, uh, times r equals 0. Uh, it basically, this substitution, rho equals kr, basically gets rid of all the physical constants in the version 1 of the, of the radial Schrodinger equation. It also transforms it into a standard equation of mathematical physics, which is what this is, in which the solutions are the so-called spherical Bessel functions. That's to say, one can say that the, the solution r is a function of the radius r is, uh, is one of two types the spherical vessel functions are either called JL of rho or also called YL of rho. There's these two different versions. In fact, for a given, see L is a parameter of the radial Schrodinger equation. That's something to keep in mind. There's really a different radial Schrodinger equation for each value of the angular momentum. And you see it here. So the solutions are parameterized by L as well. 
And this being a second order differential equation, it naturally has two linear and independent solutions, which in mathematics are called as JL and YL. These are two types of radial vessel functions. Now, if you examine these radial vessel functions in the limit in which rho goes to zero, so it's small rho, you'll find that JLs go like rho to the L power, whereas the YLs go like rho to the minus L minus one. And uh, I explained in the previous lecture why this type of behavior, rho to the minus L minus one, or radius to that power, uh, is not acceptable physically. So from a physical standpoint, free particle solutions are only the JL type solutions. And uh, if we do that, then I'll make use of this space over here. Uh, if we do that, we now have uh, the solution for the uh, free particle. Uh, just, to, just to plug in the value of the JLs, what we get is that psi is equal to JL of k rho uh, times a YLM uh, of theta and phi. And the energy is connected with a k parameter through this substitution we made over here. So I'll just connection between wave number and energy for a free particle. Uh, to get a feel for these solutions, allow me to plot the, uh, spher the J-type spherical vessel functions for you. Uh, it, looks, it looked like this. Uh, the, uh, let's make this as a function of the dimensionless variable rho, and I'll plot J L of rho. In the case L equals zero, it starts off at a constant value, so this is J zero here of rho. And then it goes down and does some oscillations like this, and the amplitude of the oscillations dies off as it goes out. For J1, it rises linearly at first, and then reaches a maximum, and then oscillates like this, goes on down. For J2, it's quadratic at first, reaches a maximum, and then oscillates on down. I'm probably not drawing this very accurately. But for each increasing, so this is a J1, this is a J2. As the L increases, the function lays down ever more flat at the origin, as I explained last time rises to reach a first maximum. This is really a caustic of the WKB theory. And then after that does an oscillation, which obviously amounts to a classically forbidden region. The, um, the, uh, uh, the magnitude of the oscillations dies off roughly, uh, dies off as one over rho, one over the radius as you go on. And this is the uh, sketch of the, uh, gives you some idea of what these, uh, uh, what these uh, spherical vessel functions look like. I will sketch the Y-type solutions. As I mentioned, they're not acceptable as uh, free particle solutions if the particle is free everywhere. Uh, but that doesn't mean they're not relevant for quantum mechanics because in scattering theory, uh, we have a situation where there's a potential, but it has a limited range. So down near r equals zero, the particle is not free. But at a large radius where the potential becomes negligible, the particle is free. And we often need to expand the wave function out of large radius in terms of free particle solutions, which means, uh, which means spherical vessel functions in the YLMs. If you do that, then you actually need the Ys, because out there, I mean, as long as you stay away from the origin, that's where the singularity of the Ys is. That's why they're not acceptable if you push all the way down to the origin. But if you don't do that, then they are acceptable. Not only are they acceptable, but actually necessary to get a complete set of uh, wave functions in the exterior region. So, in other words, they're important in scattering theory, and we'll see that come up later the next semester when we talk about scattering theory. All right, so this is the case of the free particle solutions and spherical coordinates. There is, by the way, obviously going to be a, um, a transformation. Uh, if we have uh, here is an energy eigenfunction in spherical coordinates with some given energy E. And then over here, we've got plane waves, which are also of given energy, the same energy if we make the momentum right. It's obvious that this wave function must be representable as a linear combination of those wave functions. I won't go into that now, uh, because it's just special function manipulations to convert one into the other. But we'll actually need that later on when we do scattering theory to convert, to convert a plane wave solutions into, uh, into uh, uh, central force uh, type solutions. All right. Now, at this point, I'd like to return to this question about the uh, infinite mass of the uh, force center, which we needed in order to make this two-body problem into a one-body problem. This is unrealistic. Of course, real force centers are created by particles and other things. So to create a more realistic situation, we have to include the dynamics of the force center itself. Let's say there's two of them that are particles, and that mass is m1 and m2. Now we don't have the option of attaching an inertial frame to either particle, because if we do it, it won't be inertial. So we need to just choose an arbitrary inertial frame here, x, y, and z. We can call this the lab frame. 
but then we can uh, draw the, the radius vectors in that give us the positions of the two particles, call this R1 and R2, vectors like this. And I'll also draw the line between the two particles. Uh, in the case of central force motion, the force between the particles uh, lies along this line, as I drew it. Um, these two uh, particles have a center of mass, and it lies somewhere uh, on the line joining them. Uh, if the masses are different, it won't be at the center. Let's call the center of mass position, let's give it a name called the vector capital R. So it looks like this. Now, this now becomes a two-body problem. And so the Hamiltonian for this is the sum of the kinetic and potential energies. And the kinetic energy has to be the kinetic energies of particle one plus the kinetic energies of particle two, which is expressed in terms of the momenta are p squared over two m one plus p, p one squared over two m one plus p two squared over two m two. As far as the potential energy is concerned, we will assume that it's a function only of the distance between the two particles, which I'll write this this way as the absolute value of the of the relative vector between the two. So this is central force motion with two particles now. And we'd like to solve the Schrodinger equation for this. Um, uh, this system has uh, six degrees of freedom. It's the x, y, and z coordinates of both particles. The configuration space is really six-dimensional space now. That means that the wave function, which I'll call capital psi, is a function of the coordinates of both particles, r1 and r2. So the Schrodinger equation is going to be h psi is equal to e psi, which depends on both of these coordinates, r1 and r2. In order to solve the Schrodinger equation, the way to do it is to make a transformation of variables. Uh, the transformation is motivated by the physics. We first of all introduce one variable, which is the center of mass. Call it capital R, as I've done here. The center of mass is just the mass weighted positions of the two particles. So it's uh, m1 times r1 plus m2 times r2 divided by the total mass of the system, which I'll call capital M. So let me put this over here. Capital M is defined to be m1 plus m2, like that. And in addition, let's also introduce the relative position vector between the two systems. Let's say going from m1 to m2 like this. And I'll call that vector lowercase r without any subscripts on it. So lowercase r is defined as r2 minus r1. Now this amounts to a coordinate transformation in configuration space, as you can see. Um, while I'm writing this now, let me also write down the inverse transformation, which I'll need in a moment. r1 is equal to the center of mass position, cap capital R, minus uh, m2 over capital M times the relative vector r. And r2 is the center of mass position, capital R, plus m1 over capital M times the relative vector r like this. You can easily see for yourselves that if you let capital M go to, or if you let M1, let's say, go to infinity, you go back to the earlier situation we were talking about before, where one of the masses was, was infinite. All right, so this is the transformation on the position coordinates, uh, forward and backwards, to go from the old and new coordinate system. We'd like to transform the Hamiltonian over to the new coordinates. The first obstacle we run into is the Hamiltonian has momentum in it, as well as positions. So how do we transform the momenta P1 and P2? Well, we'll do it like this. In the configuration representation, P1 is the differential operator, minus i h bar e d r1, and P2 is similarly minus i h bar e d r2. That's, that's what it is in the, in, the, in the position representation acting on wave functions like this side here. Uh, now, the, uh, let's define a momentum called a capital P, which is to be conjugate to the center of mass momentum, capital R, and it will be defined as minus I H bar D D capital R. Just make, just make that definition. Well, this can be expressed in terms of the other two momentum by just, just by using the chain rule. This becomes minus I H bar multiplied times D D R1 with respect to capital R times D D R1 plus DDR2 with respect to capital R times DDR2. These are really vectors here, and so to get it right, you really need to have, a, a, so this, this thing is really a matrix. You can track the R1 there with the R1 there. If you want to put I's on it like this, and an I there, it introduces sum on I. I can do that 
to clarify what this means, but uh, you can also think of this as a matrix multiplied by vector. Well, in any case, these derivatives, dr1 with respect to r, are easily evaluated by looking at these formulas. dr1 with respect to capital R, you see, is just unity or the identity matrix. So this thing just becomes the identity matrix. And this thing here, dr2 with respect to capital R, it's the same story. That's also the identity. <coughs> And so the result is this turns into minus IH bar simply times DDR1 plus DDR2. This is just using the chain rule. However, you now see that's the sum of P1 plus P2. And so we get a result which is nice enough that I'll put it on the line by itself. This is that the momentum is not conjugate to the center of mass position is actually the sum of the momentum of the two individual particles. Now, let's do something similar for the momentum I'll call the lowercase p, which is conjugate to the relative position. Uh, that's the same thing as we define that as minus i h bar d d r with respect to the relative position. And now you can go through the same kind of a chain rule here. And the difference is, is that the matrices that occur here are going to be the derivatives of R1 and R2, not with respect to capital R, but rather with respect to small r. So we'll get coefficients minus M2 over M and plus M1 over M. And the result is, is that the, the momentum conjugate to the relative position is minus M2 times P1 plus M1 times P2 divided by the total mass M. And this then gives us the transformation of the momentum. Work out this way. Now, um, once we have this, then we can solve these equations for the old momentum as a function of the new. It's just algebra to do it. You'll find that P1 is equal to M1 over capital M times the capital P, and then it's uh, minus, uh, minus of more case P. And then you find that P2 is equal to M2 over capital M times capital P plus lowercase p. These are the inverse, inverse transformations. And so now what we've got is a complete transformation between old, old variables, old position and momentum variables, R1, R2, P1, and P2, and new position momentum variables, capital R, center of mass, and relative position and momentum. And having that, we can now take the Hamiltonian and trans transfer it, transcribe it into the new operators. Before I do that, let me mention that the commutation is worthwhile looking at the commutation relations of the new variables amongst themselves. In the first place, we have the commutation relation of capital Ri with capital Pi. These are the center of mass position and momenta is minus Ih bar times delta Ij. The reason for that is, is that we define the capital P as this derivative with respect to R, and so the usual rules of computing the commutators work out in the usual way. Likewise, this is also equal to the commutator of the components of the relative position and relative <coughs> momenta, lowercase rij, uh, lowercase ri with uh, lowercase pj is the same commutator. This should have been a plus, by the way, plus i h, h bar delta ij. These are the main commutators here, and then all other commutators uh, that you can make by combining these uh, four sets of variables are equal to zero. So it has the same structure of commutation relations we had uh, initially with the R1, R2, and P1, and P2. The structure of the commutation relations is preserved. This is what you call a canonical transformation in classical mechanics. Uh, you could call it that in quantum mechanics too. We saw another example of canonical transformation in dealing with the problem of the charged particle in the uniform magnetic field. This is actually a little bit simpler here. But in any case, one of the consequences of this is that any function of the center of mass variables, the capital variables, will commute with any function of the relative variables. So that's a simple rule that's, uh, that, that uh, is easy to remember. Now, uh, having that transformation, Let's now transform the Hamiltonian to the, uh, to the new variable. And uh, if we do that, it's some algebra to transform the kinetic energy. 
you just plug in, plug in these formulas here into that Hamiltonian up at the top of the board. And when you do, here's what you find is the Hamiltonian now becomes the capital P squared over twice capital M, the square of the total momentum of the system divided by twice the total mass, plus lowercase p squared over twice mu, where mu is the reduced mass, plus the potential energy, which is V, and V of the magnitude of uh, R1 minus R2 is just the magnitude of the relative position vector, which I'll call R like this. Mu here, the reduced mass is defined this way, as 1 over mu is 1 over M1 plus 1 over M2. It's what you call a harmonic mean of the two masses of the two bodies. This just comes from the algebra substituting there. Mention one thing about reduced mass. If you're in a situation where one particle is much more massive than the other one, then the reduced mass is approximately the same as the, as the lighter of the two particles. So for example, in hydrogen, <coughs> the proton is much heavier than the electron. The reduced mass is almost the same thing as the electron mass. However, if two masses are equal, and the reduced mass is equal to the mass of either particle divided by two, it becomes comparable to the masses. Anyway, just some, just some rules about reduced masses. Uh, so we have two terms here. Let's call the first term, let's call it, the first term depends only on the center of mass variable, so let's call it HCM. And then the second term depends only on the relative variable, so let's call it H relative. So the total Hamiltonian breaks up into a center of mass a term plus a relative term. Moreover, these two terms commute with one another because they are functions of the different sets of variables. And that means they possess simultaneous eigenstates. You can diagonalize these two things separately. And once you've done that, you'll automatically have an eigenstate of H because H commutes with these two as well. So, the, uh, uh, so uh, this is a convenient decomposition. As far as the wave function is concerned, we started out by writing it as a function of R1 and R2. But by doing the change on position variables, which is given right up here, we can re-express it as a function of the center of mass coordinates and the relative coordinates. And if we do this, then the HCM acts only on the capital R, and the HREL acts only on the lowercase r. And the result is the Schrodinger equation is separable, and it means that solutions exist in the form of, of of a product. Let's call it capital Phi of capital R for the center of mass part and lowercase i of lowercase r for the relative part. I don't mean that every solution of the Schrodinger equation has this form, but I mean there exist eigenfunctions of this factored form. If you plug this in here, you'll find that just by applying H HCM, which acts in the first factor, and HRL acts in the second factor, what you'll find is, is that you have a, you have this breaks up into two eigenvalue problems. HCM acting on phi is equal to a center of mass energy multiplying phi. And you'll find that H relative acting on psi gives us the relative energy multiplying psi because two eigenvalue problems like this. And if you solve these, then the total energy of the entire system, the entire Hamiltonian, is just the sum of the center of mass plus the relative, the relative energy. The center of mass Schrodinger equation is particularly simple because it's a free particle problem. This corresponds to the classical fact that the center of mass of a system like this moves on a straight line with constant velocity. And so, it's, and so it appears here also. And thus the solutions for these wave functions, capital Phi of R, could be taken to be any free particle solution. We could, for example, take it to be a plane wave. This is probably the simplest solution, e to the I capital P divided into capital R over H bar, and then divided by 2 pi H bar to the 3 halves if you want to normalize it. Right? This is getting a plane wave solutions to the center of mass motion. But of course, we can also uh, do this in spherical coordinates, in which case you have spherical vessel functions. You get to choose how you want to solve this free particle problem. Having done that, we turn our attention to the relative Schrodinger equation, which is down here. And what we see about the relative Schrodinger equation is that it's an effective one-body problem. It has the same form as the one-body problems we considered earlier when we considered the force center as having an infinite mass. The only difference is 
that the uh, is that the variables in question, the position and, 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 and the positions and momenta and the coordinates um, are no longer the, uh, the well the coordinate in particular is no longer the coordinate of the particle relative to an inertial frame. Rel instead, it's the relative position between the two between the two masses. And in fact, to, look, to refer back to these equations up here, you see it's actually a function of the positions of both particles. Likewise, the momentum which occurs here is also a function of the momentum of both particles. It's worthwhile remembering that. If you're dealing with hydrogen, for example, you talk about the radius. This is really the distance from the proton. And as operators, they are their operators, they satisfy the usual operator Heisenberg Ford commutation relations. But physically, they're actually functions of the positions and momentum of both the electron and the proton. Well, in any case, mathematically, it has the form now of a one-body problem. Oh, another important change is that the, the mass of the particle, which is moving in the field, has now been replaced by the reduced mass. And except for those changes, it becomes a one-body problem, just like we were talking about a moment ago. So solving one-body problems is, uh, is enough to solve two-body problems. Uh, with uh, <coughs> when the uh, force is a central force. All right. Plus a free particle solution for the center of mass, which is, uh, which is pretty easy. Okay. Uh, so now what I'd like to do is uh, to um, is to turn to some examples uh, of central force motion. Let me begin with a simple example, which is that of a, of a rigid rotor. Uh, I'll talk about it classically first, so we get some ideas about it and a picture of it. The rigid motor we can think of as being two masses, let's call them M1 and M2, which are joined by a massless uh, rigid rod. In other words, it has a fixed uh, link, let's call it R0, connected to two. Uh, this is obviously an idealization uh, because there are no rigid rods in nature. Uh, let's say somewhere here is the center of mass position like this. And if we compute the moment of inertia of this, of this rod and rotations about the center of mass, what you will find is, is that it's the reduced mass mu multiplied by the square of the distance between the two particles. That's a classical calculation I'll let you do to see if this is true. Also, the motion, as we know, is going to be just rotating. So the two particles rotate about their common center of mass, and they're going to do so in a circle, which therefore lies in a plane. The angular momentum vector will be perpendicular to the plane. And so the angular velocity will be in the same direction. And so just by elementary mechanics, uh, the energy of the system is going to be one half of the moment of inertia times the square of the angular velocity. We also know the angular momentum is the moment of inertia times the angular velocity. And if you write the energy in terms of L instead of omega, it turns into L squared divided by twice the moment of inertia. Now here's an interesting fact. If we take this expression for the moment of inertia in terms of the reduced mass and plug it in, we get L squared over twice mu, not, twice mu times R naught squared like this. And what this shows you is that this, as you see, is actually the centrifugal, this is actually the centrifugal potential. Um, I remind you the centrifugal potential is physically a part of the kinetic energy. In fact, physically, it's the angular part of the kinetic energy. For a rigid rotor, there is no radial part because there's no radial motion. So this is all the kinetic energy there is. And I'm not including any potential here, so in fact, that's the total energy. It's the effect that comes to Hamiltonian of the system. All right. Now, the uh, configuration of the classical uh, ro rigid rotor is determined by, uh, let's say, a unit vector that points from, let's say, let me swap these back out, one and two, so that I have a vector that points from one to two going out like this. And this has a direction which we can specify as spherical coordinates by theta and phi. Basically, if you, tell you, if you tell me what theta and phi are as functions of time, you've got the complete evolution of the rigid rotor. This suggests that when we go to quantum mechanics, that the wave function should be a function of the spherical angle state in phi. It should be a wave function on the unit sphere. Likewise, this expression, either one of these two expressions, with the classical energy, 
suggests that the, qu the quantum Hamiltonian should be L squared over twice the moment of inertia, where L is now the angular momentum operator, which we know how it acts on functions on the unit sphere. In particular, it brings out, well, we know the eigenfunctions of YLM, so the energy eigenfunction should be YLMs of theta and phi. And if we let the, this Hamiltonian act on that, the L squared is going to bring out L times L plus 1 h bar squared. So we see that the energy then, and the energy depends on the, on the quantum number L, and it's L times L plus 1 h bar squared divided by 2i, which if I replace i by a reduced mass r naught squared, you can see, again, it's really the same as the centrifugal potential frozen at the radius r naught, the fixed radius. Okay, so this is some of the quantum mechanics of the rigid rotor. There's a degeneracy, you see, because the energy doesn't depend on the magnetic quantum number. Uh, this is the 2L fold plus 1, this is 2L, 2L plus 1 fold degeneracy because of the possible values of the magnetic quantum number. And the usual reason is that the magnetic quantum number indicates the orientation of the system and the energy doesn't depend on that. All right. Now, um, the rigid rotor is an idealization and you're really making a lot of guesses in terms of writing down these quantum mechanics relations. They're kind of obvious, but they're still guessing. If you wanted to make this more rigorous, you'd have to uh, make a, a to make the rigid rotor as a, as a kind of a limit of a central force problem in which you had confining potential and that, that keeps the two particles at very close to a constant radius. Uh, I'm not going to bother to go through that. Uh, it's not, not what I want to do today. But um, I just want to just want to say that this involves some guessing to what we've done. Wait, can, um, yes. So when you broke down, like okay, so we have we know that it's dependent like size and minimum theta and phi, but yep. why do you know that it's the YLMs? Because the uh, energy eigenfunctions, the eigenfunctions of L squared are the YLMs. Okay, and then how can you say or how do you know then that it's independent of M? Because the energy only depends on the L quantum number and not on the M quantum number. Because the the Hamiltonian doesn't involve any L Z. That's because it's rotationally invariant. This is the normal situation with rotationally invariant Hamiltonians. Um, all right. Now, uh, now uh, rigid rotors are idealizations that don't exist in nature, but there are uh, there are diatomic molecules which exist in nature, and they are uh, they provide many of the same features as a rigid rotor. So now I'm going to tell you about the diatomic molecules as examples of central force motion. So take a diatomic molecule, take a specific example, and look at the carbon monoxide molecule. Uh, the mass of the carbon, well, the, first of all, the atoms, the carbon and oxygen atoms are composite particles. They're not elementary particles. That's because they're made up of, of uh, subcomponents, electrons and nuclei and so on. Uh, but it is possible in quantum mechanics to treat composite particles as if they were single particles under certain circumstances. I won't go into that now, but we'll just go ahead and do that. Uh, as far as the carbon atom is concerned, the mass of the carbon is about uh, 12 times the uh, mass of hydrogen. Uh, the mass of the oxygen is about 16 times the mass of hydrogen if we take the normal isotopes. The mass of hydrogen is about something like 1,800. I'll make it very rough, roughly about 2,000 times the mass of the electron. Uh, let me also talk about the reduced mass of the carbon-oxygen system, which I'll call mu. This is about seven times the mass of the hydrogen if you work it out. Multiplying that by 2,000, we get about 14,000. I'm going to make a very rough estimate of this and just replace it by about 10 to the fourth times the mass of the electron. And I'll even leave the E off. The lowercase m will stand in the mass of the electron in the following discussion. So in the first place, uh, there is a large disparity in between the reduced mass of the system and the electron mass. It's a ratio of 10 to the fourth. This gives us already some small parameters, which I'll write like this. So first of all, mu is the reduced mass, and remind you, it's the reduced mass of the carbon oxygen system. Uh, if I divide this by the electron mass, I get, well, let me do it the other way. Put the small number on top, m divided by mu. This is about the order of about 10 to the, 10 to the minus 4, a small parameter. Another small parameter that we'll run into is the square root of this, as we'll see. This is about 10 to the minus 2. And yet another small parameter will be the fourth root of this, which
which is about 10 to the minus 1, or about 10%. We'll see these small parameters appearing. All right. Now, um, we're going to treat the carbon-oxygen molecule as a central force problem, where the two atoms interact by means of a central force potential. And so let me tell you something now about the potential between the two. I'll start by drawing a picture of it. If we uh, draw the potential like this as a function of radius r, and here's d of r, so this is the carbon-oxygen potential. It has a general structure like this. It rises very sharply at small radii, and then decreases down and creates a well, and then the well has kind of a shallow tail that goes out like this. And in fact, there's a, uh, a curve of the same shape, which applies to essentially all diatomic molecules. Uh, the physics of this is that at large distances out here, the uh, two atoms, uh, the electron clouds in the two atoms polarize each other to create dipole moments. So there's a dipole-dipole interaction. It's an electrostatic interaction between the two atoms. And that's what causes the attraction that pulls them in, just like when you comb your hair, it lifts the hair up. Uh, however, at short distances, we start to feel a repulsive force, and that arises when the two electron clouds start to overlap substantially, because you're trying to force uh, uh, you're trying to force electrons into the same region of space. It's like taking a particle in a box and keep on adding more and more electrons. They have, by the Pauli principle, they have to go into higher and higher energy levels. And so the repulsion which, which occurs here is, can be thought of, in a sense, as being due to the pressure of a uh, degenerate electron gas that's being squished into a smaller and smaller volume. Uh, and it's a competition between the two, these two effects, which gives you the well at the bottom. Now, um, there's no simple analytical formula for this curve. Uh, so I won't even attempt to, uh, to write one down. But it does have some obvious parameters. One of them is the, uh, the, the, the radius of the equilibrium position. Obviously, this is the equilibrium position and they have carbon and oxygen, uh, the carbon and oxygen molecule can undergo vibrations around this equilibrium position. This is the potential in which it's moving. So one obvious parameter, when it's in dotted lines here, is the radius, which I'll call R0, out to the minimum of the potential well. Another obvious parameter is the depth of the well, which I'll call V0, <coughs> like this. In the case of the carbon monoxide molecule, it turns out that V0 is about 11 electron volts, and it turns out that R0 is about 1.1 angstroms. <coughs> Other molecules have different numbers, but they're very roughly, they're all of the same order of magnitude. There's some, some variations in it, but very roughly, this is, this is fairly typical numbers. All right. Now, um, to understand this in a more quantitative, slightly more quantitative way, uh, there's no, as I said, there's no analytic form, analytical formula for this, so I'm going to rely on order of magnitude estimates and, and using some uh, using some dimensional analysis. Uh, as I pointed out, the forces between the atoms are determined by the properties of the electron clouds alone, whether it's the general electron pressure or, or dipole-dipole interactions. Now, the physics of the electron clouds is governed by three fundamental constants charge on the electron, the mass on the electron, and Planck's constant h-bar. The speed of light does not enter because the forces between the electrons, the electrostatic forces, are electrostatic. They're not electromagnetic. Magnetic forces are not important. There's no C in Coulomb's law. Another thing is that the, um, the velocities of the electrons are essentially non-relativistic. They're very small compared to the speed of light. So there aren't any relativistic effects either, and that's why, at least not the lowest order, and so that's why C does not enter. So given that we've got just these three constants to work with, it becomes possible to take these and do a dimensional analysis and to construct a fundamental length, a fundamental distance, time, and the length is the same as distance, a fundamental length, time, energy, etc. And if you do this, here's what you get. So let me call a fundamental, let's write it out as length, uh, let's call the fundamental length uh, A0, and uh, this turns into uh, h-bar squared divided by mv squared. And if you work this out numerically, it's about 0.5 angstroms. This is the only this is the only quantity of distance you can work out by using these three these three physical constants. <coughs> as far as energy goes, 
there is, let me call it Kangon as an energy. This is mu to the fourth divided by h bar squared. And this turns out to be about 27 electron volts. Uh, if we talk about velocity, uh, it's called a v0. This is equal to e, e squared over h bar. Um, I'm going to take this e squared over h bar and write it as e squared over h bar c times c. I said a moment ago the speed of light is not on the list, but I added, it, I multiplied it and divided by it, so c is really not there even now. But it's still useful to write it that way because e squared over h bar c is the fine structure constant. And you can see that this turns into alpha times c, which is the same thing as 1 over 137 times the speed of light. So this confirms what I said earlier, that the typical velocity of electrons is small compared to the speed of light. It's, it's less than 1% of the speed of light. It's fast, but it's not relativistic. Uh, there's a frequency that comes in, a uh, fundamental frequency. And this is basically the energy divided by h bar. So this is mv to the fourth over h bar cubed. The reciprocal of this gives us a fundamental time, t0, which is 1 over omega 0, which is equal to h bar cubed over m e to the fourth. And this is about 2 times 10 to the minus 16 seconds. It's a, it's a, pretty, uh, it's a pretty small amount of time. OK, so these are, these are the uh, quantities which enter. Now, these fundamental uh, units of, uh, of physical units of distance, energy, and so on, in fact, are exactly the same ones that arise in the hydrogen atom. And the reason is the same is you've only got these three physical constants to work with. So, for example, this A0 is the same as the Bohr radius. And this K0 here is actually twice the ionization potential of hydrogen, which, as everyone knows, is 13.6 electron volts. Multiply by 2 and you get this. Uh, this velocity, V0, is basically the velocity of the electron in the ground state of hydrogen and so on. So these are basically hydrogen numbers that are used here. Let's, uh, so uh, just on the dimensional analysis alone, we would expect that the depth of this well, the carbon monoxide molecule, as well as the radius, should be of the same order of magnitude as these numbers given here. If you look, you see that V0, the depth of the well, is something like 40% of K0, so it's not too badly off. And you see that the radius is about twice, a little more than twice the Bohr radius. So within a factor of two or so, it's actually not too bad. It gives you the right order of magnitude. You know, if you wanted to change the problem around, imagine that you made a, a molecule uh, like carbon monoxide, but instead of using electrons, you used, a, let's say, mu minus some muons, which have the same charge as electrons that are heavier. And you want to know how big would the molecule be the dimensional analysis would just tell you that you just need to replace the mass of the electron by the mass of the muon, and the answer will come out. Now, they'll be neglecting some things because they're going to be faster and so on. And still, you, know, you need to check to see that it's still not all the distance, but roughly it will be the, you'll get the correct answer. Nobody makes muonic molecules like that. There's too many muons required. But they do make muonic molecules that have one or two muons replacing electrons, and there's actually some quite some interest in that. All right. There is no such thing as muonic carbon monoxide, as far as I know. <coughs> all right. Um, um, all right. So, uh, so this is the dimensional analysis. Now, um, uh, given this, we can start to do some other things. Uh, you can see that the uh, that the uh, vibrations of the molecule are going to be represented classically by motions in this well. And therefore, quantum mechanically, they'll be quantized, and there'll be energy levels in this well. These will be the vibrational energies. Also, you can see that if we approximate the bottom of the well by a parabola, that the ground state, and hopefully the first few excited vibrational states, can be roughly described as a harmonic oscillator. So let's talk about this harmonic oscillator. Let's make a harmonic oscillator approximation to this well. That would mean that there's an approximate potential here. It would look like this. It would be 1 half the mass mu, which has to be the reduced mass of the carbon monoxide system, which is like put up there. It's 10 to the 4 times the electron mass times the vibrational frequency squared times the radius minus the equilibrium radius squared. This is the harmonic approximation. Now, we know what the reduced mass is, but we don't know what the vibrational frequency is. That depends on the, on the curvature at the bottom of the well. But it's possible to estimate the vibrational frequency. We would do this in the following way. We'll say that as a, as a, as a, really as a guess or a rough order of magnitude, 
we'll say that when the, when the uh, distance between the atoms moves a distance which is comparable to A0, which is comparable also to R0, move out that far, we must be up to the point where we're at the dissociation energy. So, in other words, let's do this. Let's equate one half mu omega vibrational squared times A naught squared for the square of the deviation away from equilibrium equals K naught, which is an estimate of the uh, dissociation energy B naught. And I'll just ignore factors of two. And as long as I'm ignoring factors of two, let's put away the one half here as well. Again, it's just a dimensional analysis. But you see, it now allows us to solve for omega B in terms of things we know. So we find omega B then is equal to B squared, it's equal to 1 over A naught times the square root of K naught divided by the reduced mass mu, like this. Now let's plug these things in. This becomes equal to H bar squared over M B squared, or uh, excuse me, it's 1 over A naught. It's M E squared over H bar squared. And then we get the square root of k naught over mu, so there's the k naught. So this becomes m over mu times e to the fourth over h bar squared. And so you can take the square root of e to the fourth over h bar squared, you get e squared over h bar multiplied here, so you get m e to the fourth over h bar cubed times the square root of m over mu. But the m e to the fourth over h bar cubed is the fundamental frequency we had here. Since the left-hand side is dimensions of frequency, the right-hand side has to be equal to this omega naught times something dimensionless. And in fact, here's what we find. So we find omega p is equal to the square root of m over mu times omega naught. So this is, a, this is an important relation. Uh, the square root of m over mu is the square root of the ratio of the mass of the, mass of the electron to the mass of the nucleus, really the reduced mass of the two nuclei which, as you see, is about 10 to the minus 2, roughly. So this means that the vibrational frequency is about 10 to the minus 2 times omega naught. And this basic factor of 10 to the minus 2, roughly speaking, applies to most diatomic molecules. Some variations, but that's the basic idea. So as a rough, rough order magnitude estimate, this is how it works. This frequency omega naught, as I mentioned earlier, is the same as the orbital frequency of the electron and hydrogen this typical orbital frequency of electrons in the carbon and, and oxygen molecules. And so h bar times this is the typical uh, energy of a, of a photon which is emitted in an electronic transition in, a, in an atom. Uh, these electronic transitions, as you know, are in the optical or also in the ultraviolet uh, regime. The 13.6 13, <coughs> electron volts for hydrogen, the ionization energy, is, uh, is in the ultraviolet. Uh, some of the other transitions in hydrogen are in the visible part of the spectrum. But what this shows is the vibrational energies are down by a factor of about 100. The vibrational frequencies, and therefore h bar omega, which is the h bar omega b, which is the delta e on a, on a vibrational transition of the molecule, is down by a factor of 100. It's the square root of the mass ratio. What that means is that the vibrational um, transition frequencies, or the photons that are emitted in and uh, or absorbed and changing the vibrational state are not in the optical, they're down in the near to middle in infrared. This is important, uh, for example, in uh, the greenhouse effect. Uh, optical radiation from the sun, uh, well, the sun puts out most of its power in the optical range of frequencies, and uh, the atmosphere is obviously transparent to, opti to light in the optical, optical range. Uh, but when the light hits the ground, it warms up the ground to something like 300 degrees Kelvin, which then radiates out thermal radiation at about that temperature. It's not exactly a black body, but it's the idea. That's the, that's the right temperature range. And that, as it turns out, is it's in, that's in the infrared. Uh, so uh, the radiation that has to, to cool the Earth off to get back out into space has to pass back through the atmosphere. But as it does so, it's in the right frequency range for exciting vibrational transitions in molecules. Now, um, carbon monoxide is not one of the uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, it's carbon dioxide is the usual culprit. Uh, that's a triatomic molecule, which I don't want to talk about. But still, the basic physics applies that its vibrational transitions of those molecules is what is absorbing uh, those infrared photons, and then they get re-emitted as well. So the <coughs> photon has to do a random walk in order to get through the atmosphere, and it, it helps insulate the Earth. Uh, 
Of course, nitrogen and oxygen are also diatomic molecules in, in the atmosphere, and they also have a vibrational spectrum that's very similar to this. There's a question about why those infrared photons don't interact with them. In other words, why aren't oxygen and nitrogen greenhouse gases as well? The reason for that is, is that those are uh, what you call um, homonuclear uh, diatomic molecules. The two atoms are identical. Uh, if the isotopes are identical, they're identical. And um, the, um, the result is that they don't have any uh, electrical dipole moment. There's no charge separation. Carbon monoxide has got a nice, it's one way or the other. Well, I'm not a chemist, so I don't know which way it is, but there's a charge separation on it. And uh, this produces a dipole moment which strongly interacts with, uh, with, uh, uh, with radiation at the right frequency. With O2 and N2, that doesn't happen because they're, they're neutral. So that's why uh, the O2 and N2 are not greenhouse gases. Yes. So, um, so the fact that, so although the N2 and the O2 have uh, vibrational um, yes. uh, transitions in, in the same range as does CO2, yes. But it's the other fact that there's no interaction between the photons and the That's right. They don't interact, interact with electromagnetic field. But they, the, the uh, infrared photon that produces an electric field that vibrates at the right frequency to, to stimulate the, the bonds, the hetero, hetero uh, uh, nuclear bonds of, of a molecule such as CO2. Okay. Um, all right. So that's a little bit of the physics of the greenhouse effect. Um, the um, uh, I mean, if, if nitrogen and oxygen were greenhouse gases, we'd be in trouble because it would be like Venus, which is, its atmosphere is mostly CO2, so it's really hot. Okay. Um, the, um, all right. So this story is not quite over yet. There's a, a other interesting things we can do. If we want to calculate the, uh, the number of vibrational eigenstates for dissociation, one of the ways of doing that is just to take the uh, dissociation energy, which was V0 here, which we'll estimate as an order of magnitude by K0. So let's take K0, and then let's just divide it by H bar omega D, which is the vibrational energy. So this is the separation between the vibrational energy levels. If you work this out, what you find is this goes as the square root of mu over m. It's the inverse of that middle square root, so it's an order of, order of about 100. And the result is the typical, typical diatomic molecules have about 100 vibrational states before they break. And, uh, and dissociate. All right. Now, this potential that I drew here is only the true potential, and I've been ignoring the centrifugal potential. Uh, before I get to that, though, there's one more thing to say. Um, the vibrational energy, is the ground state vibrational energy, is of course one half h bar omega v, the vibrational uh, frequency. And uh, for many molecules, this is comparable to or somewhat larger than room temperature. So at ordinary temperatures, the it's common for diatomic molecules to be mostly in the ground state, vibrational ground state, or perhaps just in the low-lying quantum numbers, vibrational quantum numbers. Let's calculate the size of the wave function in the vibrational ground state to get an idea of how big the vibrational amplitude is. So that's fairly easy. We go back to the, so I call this delta R here. Let's call this delta R as the, as the width of this. It's a Gaussian wave path that you see. The width of this Gaussian wave packet. What is it equal to? Well, if we go to the, the story of harmonic oscillators, you look in the notes on harmonic oscillators, and you look at the characteristic length, uh, scale length for harmonic oscillators, it's square root of h bar over m omega, and you look in the notes and see that. And this delta r is really the same thing, except uh, the h bar is the same, but the mass is replaced by the reduced mass, and the omega becomes the vibrational frequency omega v like this. Now this has dimensions of length, so it's got to be proportional to our A0 times the dimensionless number. And if you work it out, that dimensionless number is the mass ratio m over u to the one quarter power times A0, which is very roughly something like 10% of the Bohr radius. And so very roughly, the idea is, is that in the ground vibrational state, the molecule is undergoing a zero point oscillation whose magnitude is about 10% of the equilibrium radius. And in that sense, it is very close. It is, a, is roughly a rigid, uh, a, a, a rigid rotor. It's got some small vibrations. The radius doesn't, doesn't change very much. And I see I didn't hear the bell there because I think it's so interesting. Well, it's too bad. I've just got a couple more comments to do to finish the story of molecules here. Uh, and then we'll go on to the hydrogen atom, which we'll talk about in a minute. Okay, that's all.